Good morning. Welcome to the Sanctuary Christian Fellowship. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for your word. We pray that your words and your heart be transferred to mine and to others who are listening. Not only listen, but to believe and do your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Today's message is called KISS, K-I-S-S. -S. It means keep it simple and sincere. Jesus had a real issue with religious leaders of his day. Rather than simply obeying God's commands, they made it so difficult for people because they added on their stuff and their regulations just for their best interest, not God's. So what happened is that Jesus, it got Jesus' attention. It led him to confront these religious leaders. And Jesus didn't mix words and he never does. He says what he means and means what he says. Because they were trying to manipulate God's word. He called them hypocrites living by double standards. They taught one thing, but they live another. He said, you worship me with your lips, but your heart is so far from me. He wanted them to stop the lip service. Unfortunately, this attitude is so obvious today, mostly in politics. It's not a loving playing field anymore. Um, it's not honest or it's not consistent. Public and political pressures have more influence than God's truth. The truth is shunned and becomes relative. It all depends. A lie is called an untruth or misspoken. A dramatic change of opinion is called evolution. Abortion is called a legal personal option to end life. And this attitude is ever present in today's culture. Many try to stretch the truth to fit their agenda, their needs, rather than to obey God. How sad. We live in such perilous times as the Bible predicted many, 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 many years ago. So God saw the need for him to intervene into humanity. That's the greatest reason why he sent Jesus to untangle us from the sticky mess people were living in. And we are still living in, in today's culture. And it's intensifying. The only answer that will save this corrupt, dying world is God's love. Nothing else can do what only God can do. So love is a catalyst. It makes things stronger. It makes life worth living and holds things together. John 3.16 says, God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. This scripture is in the heart of God's, uh, God's purpose, why he sent Jesus. Love is at the very core that he taught and what he's constantly teaching about and what he does. God tells us why love is so important and the consequences if we do not have love. Jesus is what a catalyst, love. Jesus is the only reason for every season in our life, why he doesn't want us to wander off without real hope of a future without him and eternally lost. This is basic Christianity 101. And I think there are times that life can be too complicated, gets really messy, and we tend to forget what this Christianity thing that we're involved with is all about. I think it would be wise to take regular intervals to go back to the basics, to make sure that a foundation is solidly in place. If we discover any evidence of doubt, fear, unbelief, we are to get rid of them immediately. Don't delay. So what is the greatest commandment? Basic Christian 101. Matthew 22, 37 to 39 says, Jesus replied, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. The second is equally important, love your neighbor. Who's your neighbor? Your spouse, your family, your friends, people. People are all around you as yourself. God says you must love. There's no option. So what is your greatest commission? Matthew 8, 18 to 20. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the end of this age. With God's help, 
He wants us to reach the unlost before it's too late. Reach the lost, teach them to obey God's commands. What are we to teach? 1 John 4, 16 says, God is love. It doesn't say God has love. God is love. Whoever loves, whoever lives in love, lives in God and God in them. The Bible tells us about the many gifts God gives the body of Christ, all important. But the catalyst that keeps all of these things together is called the most excellent way. We can have everything God wants us to have, do what he tells us to do, say what he wants us to say. But if God, excuse me, if love isn't a central motivation, then all is worthless. How are we to love God and love others? 1 Corinthians 13 describes and give us an insight of what God, excuse me, what love should be and how vital it is to fulfill the greatest command that God gives us. Verse 4 says, Love is patient, kind, not envious, not boastful or proud. It does not honor, it does not dishonor others, not self-seeking, not easily angered, keeps no record of wrong. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in truth. It always protects, always trusts, hopes, and perseveres. Here it is, verse 8. Love never fails. And now these three things remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Sometimes we may think, what is this love anyway? What does true love look like? How are we to use it? What are the evidences and the results of love? Scripture tells us that we're destroyed by the lack of knowledge. If we don't know, we don't know. In other words, we don't know what we don't know or should know what we should know. We're ignorant. What basics should we already know? Again, what is God's greatest commandment? Love God first. Exodus 20, 3 and 5 says, Make it very clear, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on earth, on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. No other God. Love others. 1 John 4, 19 and 21. We love because he first loved us. Whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. Pure and simple. There are several ways to express our love for each other, our brothers and sisters. After over 36 years of being with the love of my life, Lilia, I can tell you there will be many ups and downs and sideways. You will need God's help. You cannot do it alone. Love can be wonderful at times and sometimes a little bit challenging. The best way to love is to kiss. Keep it simple and sincere. The best two ways I know of is to show and tell. It would be great not only to say I love you, but to show that you love them. True love should be expressed in ways that we say, what we say, and what we do. It's the verbal and the nonverbal. There are several ways people give and receive love. In his book, The Five Love, love Languages, Gary Chapman addresses them. The first, is, first way is words of affirmation. Saying I love you, I'm sorry, I appreciate you, thank you, you're the best, fills a person's heart. These are compliments that need to be here often. Encouraging words are therapeutic. It really cleanses your soul and gives peace. It shows that you recognize, care, and you value people. On the other hand, complaining, rumbling, cursing, and criticizing cuts deep wounds in their hearts and won't be easily forgiven nor forgotten. The second way is quality time. Remember this, quality over quantity. It's giving the other person your undivided attention. It's not only hearing, but intentionally listening. Listening that shows that you care. Distractions, cancel dates, not showing up, can, be e can especially be hurtful and very harmful. The third is receiving gifts. Gift giving doesn't have to be expensive, but it has to be genuine. Why? Because you cannot buy love. 
gifts of love can be physical reminders. Every time they look at it, they read it, or use it, it reminds them of how much you love them. Acts of service. For these people, action speaks louder than words. No wah, no lip service. Taking the initiative to help without being asked is huge in somebody's heart. It demonstrates that you really care and appreciate them. Small things done in love makes a world of difference. How about physical touch? Hugging, holding hands can be a major thing that holds relationships together. To this, a person not only speaks more deeply than an appropriate physical touch. My, my wife loves to hold hands and, and have a hug. She's a hugger and it expresses her love and affection for people. With these principles in mind, I want to share what true love is according to God's word. Kiss. Keep it simple and sincere. First is, true love is always sincere. Romans 12, 9 and 10 says, don't just pretend to love others. Really love them. Hate what is wrong. Hold tightly to what is good. Love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. What a wonderful scripture. God says that his mercies are new every morning, great as thy faithfulness. It is the same with love. We should fill ourselves with a fresh new supply of genuine love each morning. God's love is the most powerful force in the universe. Let me repeat that. God's love is the most powerful force in the universe. Love encourages, love strengthens, love energizes, love empowers, love forgives, love heals. God's perfect love casts out all fear. Love is a catalyst that transforms our lives and makes the impossible possible. There's nothing more phony than someone who says that they love you with conditions attached. I love you when or if. That's not real love. That's called a prenuptial agreement. God's love is unconditional and offered to anyone without any strings attached. His love is an antidote to hatred. It will change and that change the course of your life. Love is the cure that heals and mends your broken hearts. Love is to remain. Deep love expects the best, even when things look the worst, especially in today's culture. Deep love expects the best. It neutralizes hurt and promotes healing and restores your joy. But it has to be sincere. Fake love doesn't produce anything but a shallow, fake life. Don't just pretend to love others, really love them. True love says and does, talk is not enough, we have to walk in love. 1 Corinthians 13, 1 says, If I could speak all the languages of earth and of angels, but did not, didn't love others, I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. We can be impressed with great speakers, but God isn't. He is more interested if they're living a life of loving him and loving others. Words without love is just noise. Charisma without character has a very, very limited shelf life. Words matter. The heart that reinforces the word matters, but they are just a part of love. What completes love is showing it. John 15, 13 says, There is no greater love than to lay down one's life for a friend. Laying down means to serve. One of the five love languages, again, is acts of service. Again, for these people, action speaks louder than words. Matthew 20, 28 says, For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others, and give his life as a ransom for many. He continually, continually exemplified his servant's heart because of his compassion. Compassion should lead to action. True love is never stagnant. It's never passive. It is, dyna is dynamic and proactive. True love activates a heart that wants to serve God. The highest deserve, the highest purpose is to serve God and to serve others. It wants to make a difference to enrich lives. 
you'll discover that when you help others, God will bless you abundantly. It says in Luke, I love this, Luke 6, 38. For you forgive, you will get. Your gift will return to you full and overflowing measure, pressed down, shaken together to make room for more. And running over, whatever measure you use, large or small, will be used to measure what is given back to you. The more generous you are, the more generous God is. Why? Because He can trust you with the blessings. In God's economy, the more you give, the more you receive in return. Wow! Anybody wants a part of that? But there is a condition. You must serve and give willingly, not reluctantly or under pressure. God appreciates when you do it cheerfully, voluntarily, and with love. The second principle is sometimes love can be painful. Hebrews 12, 10 and 11 says, For our earthly fathers disciplined us for a few years, doing the best they knew how, but God's discipline is always good for us, so that we might share in His holiness. There's a vast difference between being disciplined and being punished. Punishment is the consequences you experience after you do something wrong. Discipline is based on preventing you from doing wrong before you do it so you don't have to experience the consequences. Yes, we will experience two kinds of pains. All of us will. The first pain that we'll suffer is called the SOS pain. Doing the same old of the same old, expecting different results. It's called insanity, right? People refuse to change because of pride, stubbornness, laziness, or complacency. They don't want to change. The second is growing pains. When we start to go back, when we start to go back in physical shape, oh, there's a good pain that we have. You know, the good pain says that you're growing, you're doing something, you're getting healthier. Why? Because we do live in a counterculture world. God's instructions. Okay, sometimes are really contrary to what the world says we should be doing. But when we obey God's commands, He promises that we will live in peace and joy and blessings. If we don't, we'll live in the consequences of our choices. And it denies God from doing what He wants to do. To bless us abundantly. John 10.10 10. God's discipline will always bless us. Hebrews 12, 11 says, No discipline is enjoyable while well, it's happening. Can you hear any men? Right? It is painful, but afterwards it will be a peaceful harvest of right living for those who are trained in this way. So you get to choose your pain. Either one. Also, true love forgives. 1 Peter 4, 8 says, Most important of all, continue to show deep love for each other. For love covers a multitude of sin. 1 Corinthians 13, 5 says, Love does not, excuse me, does, love does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrong. That's a tough one. You can be right, but you can be still wrong because of a bitter and unloving attitude. Arguments, disagreements, gossip, criticizing, complaining. Just too much drama. Arguing is poison that kills, steals, and destroys your love. When arguing is present, people are more likely to be offended. And when you're offended, hurt people continue to hurt other people. But God's love will heal hurt people. It will stop the cycle of hurting other people. We need to always love and respect each other, even when we don't see eye to eye with things. God commands us, not suggests, commands us to love and forgive. Ephesians 4.32 says it this way, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ, just as in Christ, God has forgiven you. And the third principle is, true love is simply Jesus. The book of Revelation, God warns the churches that they were losing their passion for the Christ because of too many distractions and wrong priorities. Though he recognized and appreciated they were doing what they were doing, but their love has gone cold. God told them to go back to the first love, to rekindle the passion for him. Go back to the heart of worship. 
loving God was to take top priority. Nothing else. No one else. Nothing else could replace it. As I repeat, the story of Martha and Mary is a great example of what God considers most important, the most excellent way. It should be a constant reminder of the truth that it reveals our love relationship with Jesus. Let me read a little bit, Luke 10, 38 to 42. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet, listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations she had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister was, has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her to come and help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered. You are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. Let me kind of stretch that a little bit and give more insight. Martha invites Jesus and his disciples to come over to the house for a meal. When they arrived, she was so busy preparing that she didn't even greet them and made them feel welcome in her home. In the midst of all this preparation, Martha's attitude turned a little bit bitter. She got mad. Her sister Mary, on the other hand, when Jesus entered her home, she greeted them, welcomed them, and sat at Jesus' fit, uh, feet, anxious to listen to what he has to say. But Martha, her bitter attitude, led her to confront Jesus. Can you imagine it? She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister left me? To do all the work by myself? Can you imagine Martha having the nerve to go to Jesus and complain? Not only that, she told him that what he ought to do. Tell Mary, come help me. Martha was distracted by doing too much of being of too much. She thought that she was doing good, and she was. Jesus appreciated all her hard work. But Mary chose to do something more important, to honor and to be with Jesus. But I notice this. Notice this. Jesus wasn't offended. He loved. I love how Jesus responded to Martha. As he expressed what he considered most important. This is Martha, Martha. The Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things. But few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. Here's the bottom line. Jesus wants intimacy before activity. Our attitude can turn negative and, and bitter when we choose to worry about all the things we have to do on our things to do list. Worry leads to being upset. There are many who are stuck doing things for God, but love isn't the motivation. The most important reason why we do things for Christ is simply because we love Him. And our greatest desire is to make Him happy. Yes, Jesus appreciates the Marthas and all of what they do, but not the, at the expense of not loving Him first. 1 Corinthians 14, 1 says, Go after a life of love as if your life depended on it, because it does. If you go after something, it means that you make a choice to pursue, pursue it because it is important to you. Love is a choice. Nothing, there is nothing greater than to choose love and to go after it every single day of your life. When you choose to love in spite of how you feel or your present circumstances, you choose to live and love like Jesus loves and lives. He made a choice to go after us. So what is this thing called love? Is it an emotion? No, it's much more than just an emotion. It's tangible and intangible. It has the powerful potential to change your life, your circumstances, and your future. But it also can be misused, misinterpreted, misunderstood, and misdirected. True love is simply Jesus. Nothing more, nothing less. Kiss. Keep it simple. Keep it sincere. Love God. Love others. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. The world needs more of your grace, your mercy, and your love. We ask you 
to heal our broken, divided world and our broken lives. Nothing can do what only your love can do. Help us to be patient as we wait for your perfect timing. Galvanize our faith and keep our hope alive. We recommit our lives to you and place our total trust in you and you alone, knowing that you always have our best interests in mind. Remove whatever is stopping us from receiving your blessings. We need more of you. Lord, thank you for loving us the way that you do. We thank you for you, in Jesus' name. Ahuiho.